Can I say, first of all, can I say, first of all, thank you to Kate O'Rourke and to the Society of uh, Labour Lawyers. Uh, thank you to you all for giving up your Sunday afternoon. Thank you to the South Bank for hosting this. Thank you to, for my, to my friends in the media for coming here. There seemed to be more than when I actually stood for the leadership of the Labour Party <laughs> some years ago. I want to talk about the mission of the Labour Party, the reason we join the Labour Party, the values we share in common, the purpose that we have in politics. Call our mission a desire or a demand for social justice. Call it social democracy. Call it democratic socialism. Call it an irreversible shift in the balance of wealth and power in favor of working people. Call the mission using the power of the community to advance the cause of the individual. Call it as we used to do, working for the many and not just the few. Call it as Orwell did in the most undogmatic of ways, the search for decency. All these values, these objectives set out. Leaders come and leaders go, and I know that. <laughs> Politi politicians are here today uh, and they're gone tomorrow. But the values endure and the mission is forever. Now we could spend a huge amount of time arguing about the detail of a program or the detail of a constitution as if we were theologians arguing about the texts and the catechisms. We have leaders and we have members who want to be more concrete and some of them who want to be more vague. I remember the difficulties Ramsay MacDonald, who was a leader in the 1930s, got into when he was asked what was his direction of travel and he said, we shall go on and on and on and up and up and up. We shall do things by this way and by that way and by the other way and didn't really add much to the debate that we were having. But you know, it comes down to one central thing. A socially just society where there is equality of opportunity and fairness of outcome. Equal opportunities for all, unfair privileges for no one. And that's why I'm in the Labour Party. And that's why I suspect that the many people here who are in the Labour Party joined the Labour Party in the first place. Not to support an individual policy, this or that. Not necessarily to support an individual personality, this or that. Not just to defeat your rivals and opponents, so there are very good reasons for defeating the conservative enemy that we have. Not simply Labour as a party of conscience. Labour, we join because of this fundamental belief. As R. H. Tony said, the difference in British political democracy is not about different leaders, it's about different social objectives. As Harold Wilson said, we are a crusade or we are nothing. We cannot just be a party with a program. We have got to be a movement with a soul. Now the Conservatives wake up in the morning and revel in free markets. The Nationalists, they want to support independence. While they wake up in the morning dreaming of how they can achieve independence, we wake up in the morning thinking about how we can advance the cause of social justice. And that puts a particular responsibility on us. Because the test of whether we advance social justice cannot be in the abstract. We have got to show how we can make a difference to people's lives. It is not simply the passion by which we pursue it or the number of meetings or resolutions that we pass at meetings that is the test of our progress. We can only measure the progress we make by the difference we make in people's lives. The young mother and a family and how we can lift her out of poverty. The pensioner who feels insecure and how we can give him or her dignity in retirement. The patient waiting for a health service operation and how we can use the best qualities of the health service to give the best treatment to that person. Most of all, perhaps the young kid who has been left out is losing out, is being left behind and how we can deliver the best opportunity in education and the best start of life. And I saw these needs and how they had to be met. And I saw them magnified in my last days as a member of parliament. A woman who came to me who couldn't even afford the bus fare to go to the food bank that she needed to have the vital provisions for her child. A man who was told by the health service that he now had to pay for vital equipment when he himself was in desperate need of care with very little money. 
A worker told me how much she, her rights were being violated by being cheated out of the basic minimum wage. And that is the challenge that we meet as Labour Party members. How we can advance social justice is not an abstraction. It is a question of how we can immediately improve the conditions of the lives of people. And that means something else. It is not an abandonment of principles to seek power and to use that power in government. It is the realization of principles. If we believe that politics is about using the power of the community to advance the individual, then we cannot separate the ends, which are social justice, from the means, which is finding power and persuading people to vote for us to win elections to deliver that power. Power for its own sake is wrong. Power for the sake of others is a moral duty. We cannot deliver in government without power. We can deliver our principles only when we have power. In our DNA as labor is this central truth that we need both to advance our objectives by talking about the need for social justice and we need to find the means by winning power in government and by persuading people to do it. So when the conservatives say that politics is the art of the possible, I say that's not enough. Politics is making the desirable possible. That's why we joined the Labour Party. But to make the desirable possible, we must also make the desirable popular, and we must make it electable. And that is the lesson that we're going to have to learn now. Now, I come here today just as people are about to receive the ballot papers. In fact, true to the prudence of the Labour Party, the ballot papers have gone out on Friday by second-class post <laughs> and not first-class post, and they may arrive on Monday or perhaps Tuesday or Wednesday. And I'm here not asking for your vote and not as a candidate. I'm here, as I said to someone a few days ago, I'm too uh, old to be a comeback kid. I'm too young to be an elder statesman. I have no title. I never want any title. I'm here as an ordinary member of the Labour Party. As someone who, with my wife Sarah, wanted to volunteer at the election to knock on doors to get the Labour vote out, who was very proud that my young son said that they wanted to canvass with me, who was given, like so many thousands of people all over the country, we have given our lives to the Labour Party. And for us, the Labour Party is part of our family. And I think I understand how people feel today and have felt since that night of the general election. We are grieving. It really hurts. I know myself as someone who should know because of what happened in 2010 what it is like to feel rejection and to feel defeat. We are grieving and it hurts. And I'm not here to attack any individual candidate. And I'm not here to say, abandon your high ideals. What I'm here to say is that the best way of realizing our high ideals is to show that we have an alternative in government that is credible, is radical, and is electable, is neither a pale imitation of what the Tories offer, nor is it the route to being a party of permanent protest rather than a party of government. And I want to set out what I think needs to be done. We are grieving. It's worse than that. There is demoralization and there is despair and that's reflected in what is happening in the talks amongst Labour members. And there's only one word to describe it. Our hearts are broken. But you know, there is one thing worse than having broken hearts. It is powerlessness. Our hearts can be broken, and yet it is worse to find out we are powerless to do anything about it. To see a wrong and not to be able to right it, to see an injury and an injustice and not be able to correct it, to see suffering and be able to do nothing about it, to see pain and know you cannot heal it, to see good that needs to be done and change that needs to be made and not to be 
in a position to do it. And when I know, and I argue, and I think you believe, that the only way that we can avert the pain and end the suffering is by securing in future the election of a Labour government to deliver on our priorities. And when I see the opinion polls that say that the one grouping in the party that is likely to get most votes is the one grouping that even its own supporters say is least likely to be able to form a government, then we have to look at the lessons of our history. In the next few days, it will be a hundred years since Keir Hardy, the person who is accredited with founding the Labour Party, uh, died in September 1915. And Keir Hardy learned one lesson in the 30 and 40 years that he was in poverty and when he was working for change. And the lesson he learned was that he had to form a Labour Party that sought power in Parliament, that needed to win the support of people to gain an election. Otherwise, he could make no difference to the conditions of people's lives. You see, when Keir Hardy started in politics, he found that there were many socialist societies. There was many debating organizations. There were many campaigning groups. They were all working for their own purposes and working for what they thought were common aims. But they weren't working to form a Labour government or even to create a Labour party in the country. And Keir Hardy decided that his mission was to bring the socialists and the trades unionists and the progressive forces in the country together to form for the first time a Labour party that had the distinctive aim of electing working people to parliament to pursue a course that would lead to Labour in government. We think of Keir Hardy as the first socialist. He was one of the first socialists. His uniqueness is that he saw, above all, the need to create a Labour Party and to bring people together to do so, so that we could win democratic power to change people's lives. He had seen how with protests and with debating societies and with campaigning groups, we could make a noise but not make a difference. He could see how debating societies and campaigning groups were talking to each other, but not talking to the people they sought to represent and whose support they needed. It was difficult for Keir Hardy, by the way, because when 29 Labour MPs were elected in 2006, there was a very different kind of leadership election that took place. He got 14 votes. His opponent got 14 votes. Ramsay MacDonald, who was to be a leader later on, whom I mentioned earlier, abstained. They had a second ballot, 14-14, Ramsay MacDonald abstained. They then found it was Ramsay MacDonald who had abstained. And Keir Hardy forced him to vote for him, and he became leader of the Labour Party. So not much changes in the way the Labour Party organises and conducts its election. But Hardy achieved this one thing. Old age pensions, he supported. Votes for women, he supported when we didn't have them. Home rule for Scotland, he supported. And Ireland, when it wasn't there... He supported workers' rights, an end to unemployment, a national health service, pensions for people, help for people with industrial injuries. And by creating a Labour Party that was able to do these things, and he made it electable, Labour was able to put its priorities into practice by forming a government. And why did Keir Hardy devote his life to simply creating this mechanism that was designed to get us into power because he saw it as a moral duty. Think of one of his colleagues who later became a member and then chairman of the Independent Labour Party, James Maxson, a Clydeside teacher, a socialist, the man who's accredited with taking the slums into Parliament and making the whole of Britain aware of the slum housing that existed. The man who was called the children's champion, a rebel, never formed any part of any government always wanted the Labour Party to move faster. But what did he say? He said what Keir Hardy also said. In our makeup, he said, as Labour Party members, when we see something that is wrong, when we see something that has got to be corrected, there is an anger, there is a desire to change things. It is at the root of our belief that society has to change fundamentally to meet the needs of the people. But when we see something 
where peop some, someone, where someone is suffering? What part of us does not well up in pity and com compassion and demand the immediate relief of that suffering that is being caused to that victim? The election of a Labour government to do what it can, even if it is inch by inch, to relieve the suffering of that person. And that was Maxton's aim. And that's why, for all the protests and for all the difficulties, he urged the election of a Labour government and made it his priority, even as a rebel, that we had to elect a Labour government to relieve the suffering that people had. And think of these words of Tony Blair, to use the power of the community to support and advance the interests and the cause of the individual. And think of the words of John Smith. John Smith, whom I, I knew well. Some of you here in London, uh, I maybe shouldn't tell this story, but every time uh, I was with John Smith and the Labour Party was using that great song, Jerusalem, at all of its rallies and meetings, and I would be standing next to John Smith, and it came to this verse that said, England's green and pleasant land. And he always sang it as Britain's green <laughs> and pleasant land. I'm sorry uh, for William Blake's great composition, and he did it. But what did John Smith say? And I was there. I was sitting across from him the night, tragically, that he died in 1994. He was addressing a meeting, and what did he say? All I ask, he said, is the opportunity to serve. He didn't say, I want the opportunity to protest. He didn't say, I want the opportunity to make a song and dance about this policy or that policy. He said... I need and I want the opportunity to serve, to form a government, to take action to relieve the suffering that he described around him, to make a difference to society. I think of Neil Kinnock and what he said. Remember that memorable speech that Neil Kinnock made about he was the first Kinnock for a thousand generations to be able to go to university and his wife, Glenys, the same, the first in her family for a thousand generations to be able to go to university. I know Neil well, and I was talking to him uh, the other day. He came up to Edinburgh, I remember, when he was a very young MP, and we were showing him around Edinburgh. And of course, Edinburgh is full of cemeteries, and it's full of all sorts of places. He came to this grave, and there was a grave mark. Here lies Tory and gentleman. And he said, funny, how could two people get into such a small grave? <laughs> but what did Neil say? He talked about his family. They had the talent. They had the determination. They had the need to get qualifications, to get education. And what did he say? They did not have the platform upon which to stand. And what made possible that platform? Only the election of a Labour government could make that possible. Only people who made it their business, the priority to get the election of a Labour government, only people who saw that we could not just be a party of protest, only people who saw that to make the desirable possible, we had to be electable and we had to be popular with the people, could build that platform on which Neil and others, millions of others, because of the work of previous Labour governments, could stand with the opportunities for education. And just think of one other person, probably the person that most of us in all our lives admire most of all, Nelson Mandela. I was lucky. I was a friend of Nelson Mandela because I met him just after he came out of prison. I knew his wife, Grasha Michelle, and I knew his family. And I met him on numerous occasions. And a man who was in private, as dignified uh, and as wonderful as you saw him in public. We brought him to London, some of you may know, for his 19th, 90th birthday. And we had this uh, celebration to raise money for his foundation. Some of you may know that he auctioned a, portrait, a, a letter that he'd written, Letter to a Child. And that was auctioned to raise money for his foundation. And they had this, 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 um, this auction. And it had all the celebrities there, from Bill Clinton to lots of actors, Forbes, Whitaker, and Smith, and all these people, Emma Thompson, all there. And it ended up with a bid between Elton John and Oprah Winfrey. And Elton John went to 900,000, as high as that. And then uh, uh, Oprah Winfrey, 950. Elton John to a million. Oprah Winfrey then beat him and Elton John pulled out at 1.1 million. And then, I'm told she, she, and then I'm told she was then told that she was paying in pounds and not dollars, <laughs> as she thought. And then we went to this celebration the day after where Nelson Mandela was speaking 
uh, to a crowd of people at the Nelson Mandela concert. Some of you may, be, may have been there. And I was very lucky. I was sitting next to him. Uh, and I was um, helping him hide the champagne he was drinking from his wife, who had told him not to drink, which I thought was a bit much on his 90th birthday to refuse <laughs> the chance to uh, drink. And then we went downstairs and met the, uh, the performers. And the late, sadly late, Amy Winehouse was there. And she came up to meet on Nelson Mandela and said, Mr. Mandela, she said, you and uh, my husband have a great deal in common. And Nelson Mandela sort of stumped and he didn't know what to say. And she said, yes, she said, both of you have spent a long time in prison. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, <laughs> Nelson Mandela, what did he say to the South African parliament after he became president? In his first 100 days, he said this. At the end of the day, the yardstick by which we will be judged is one and only this. How we better through our endeavors, the condition of the people. This was a man who'd spent 30 years almost in prison, who'd had by virtue of apartheid and exclusion to have been simply a prisoner of protest. He had to run a party that couldn't even stand for elections to win power. But what did he say? As a man who could have elevated protest above everything else, he said, no, the test of what we will do is how we can win power and use it for the people of the country. John Smith, Neil Kinnock, Nelson Mandela, they all send a message. Politics is the art of making the desirable possible. But to make the desirable possible, you have to be electable and you have to be popular. I think of our Labour councillors today who are doing the most difficult job throughout the whole of the country. They're being asked to keep sure start centres open against the odds. They're being asked to help provide for the elderly care services against the odds. They're being asked to help young people who need apprenticeships against the odds. They're being asked to run public services like libraries that are being cut because of central government decisions and they're doing it against the odds. And what is the message that they send? They've got to tell people that yes, we will do our best in the circumstances we find ourselves, but yes too, protests will not be enough. We will need to work hard for the election of a Labour government. And look at an iron Bevan one of our greatest leaders, the man accredited creating the National Health Service. He didn't beat about the bush in Iron Bevan. He said the big question was not whether we achieved the great lofty social objectives that I've talked about. He said the question is, where is the power and how can the working families and working people of this country get hold of it? And he told a story about how his father had taken him to Tridigar where he was brought up, taking him to the local council and said, this son, this is where the power lies. So he stood for the council and was elected to the local council. And when he arrived at the council, the clerk of the council said, look, son, the power has moved from here. It's not here anymore. It's in the county council. So he got elected to the county council. And then he found when he got to the county council, he could do nothing because there was not enough money. And local government was being cut once again by central government. So he decided to go to parliament. So in 1929, he was elected to parliament. And he got there and he said, look, I thought the power lay here, but I find it's with the government. And no doubt he would say now, power is not just with this government, but with global institutions around the world. And he said the issue was, how do we get power to enable poverty, to use democracy, to unwind privilege in the interest of working people? And he never gave up on this. Not for him, Labour, as a party of protest. Not for him simply making the desirable possible without making Labour popular and electable. And when in 1931 Labour was... Uh, beaten. And Jenny Lee, who was to be his future wife, and she came from my constituency and I knew and met her. And she said to him she was going to stay with the Independent Labour Party as a party of protest. Do you know what he said? He quoted Hamlet. And Hamlet to Ophelia. And he said, get thee to a nunnery and have done with it. He said, your epitaph will be pure but impotent. You can be as pure as you like, but you will achieve absolutely nothing. And he said, like it or like it not, the Labour Party is the instrument that people in this country have chosen. And for all its failings, the working people of the country look to us. And we better make it the instrument that can make the changes that are necessary. And he went on with Jenny Lee 
and with Clement Le Attlee, a leader that everybody undervalued, but who presided over a great Labour government to create the most socially reforming government in our history. A man who started off by saying, where is the source of power? Was able to create the National Health Service, power for a purpose. The National Insurance Act came, the National Insurance Injuries Act, the Town and Country Planning Act, the Children's Act, independence for India. Who could say, with that reforming Labour government attacked on all sides by people who said it was better to rebel and protest than to be in government, who could say that that was not putting power into practice in the way that all of us should think is the best way to move the country forward, not just then, but today. And I want to tell you about my own experience. 1979 to 1997, 18 years, 14 years of which I spent in Parliament. And we could run demonstrations, and we could run rallies. We had marches. We had the biggest march for jobs the country has ever seen in Glasgow with more than a million people in 1982 yeah. under Michael Foote's leadership. The same as the march we had on Upper Clyde shipyards in 1972 where John Smith and Donald Dewar and I and many marched to secure the jobs of people in the shipyard. But you know what happened? When we left power in 1979 and people criticized us, there were 1.2 million people unemployed. When we got back into power in 1997 to undo the damage, there were more than 2 million unemployed. In 1979, there was one million children in poverty. By 1997, there were four million. By 1979, the Tories had put 20% of pensioners into poverty. And by 1997, the figure that we had to deal with was 40%. And all these damages that had been done by the Tories, we had to undo in 13 years of Labour government. And what's more, they had created inequality in the country that was 50% higher than ever they had inherited. And I remember one thing about that period, the miners' strike. Because I had 10 miners' strike centres in my constituency. And I remember the suffering because the Conservative government refused to allow even the children of the families of miners to get the benefits that were necessary for them to meet the demands of even basic food. And the relief of Social Security was transferred from the Social Security office to a soup kitchen. And when my local authority in Fife decided they would use the 1968 Social Work Act, which allowed them to relieve the distress of families and children, they were surcharged. And what these miners' families would have given them for a Labour government. So yes, in 1997 and afterwards, we made mistakes. We all make mistakes. It's human to make mistakes. But you know, the national minimum wage was not a mistake. Sure Start was not a mistake. The New Deal paid for by the utilities, £5 billion for 2 million young people to get jobs was not a mistake. 30,000 nurses, 30,000 doctors, 80,000 nurses, 30,000 more teachers was not a mistake. Pensioners, winter allowance, free bus travel, free prescriptions, none of that was a mistake. And of course, rights for lesbian and gay community, the end of Section 28, which we did immediately, freedom of information, all the changes we brought about, devolution for Scotland, ending the role of aristocracy in the House of Lords, all these were not a mistake. And let me just say one other thing, that when we intervened to help families financially during the recession, when we took what are called Keynesian measures to prevent a recession becoming a depression and spent money that was necessary to help businesses and help individuals and help mortgage holders, that was not a mistake either. And I say to you another thing, that when we managed in that recession, which was the worst since the 1930s, to have half the unemployment of the recessions of the 70s, 80s, and 90s, half the business bankruptcies, we managed to have half the level of mortgage repossessions and more. That was not a mistake either. And it is not a mistake now. And it is not a mistake now. It is not a mistake now to want power. It is not a mistake now to do what is necessary to get back to power. And it is not a mistake to judge our advance as a party by the seriousness which we approach getting power. Nelson Mandela taught me one other thing. In his prison cell, Nelson Mandela was allowed very few possessions. And some of you may know just how bare that cell is if you've been there and seen it or seen the films of it. 
that he had one picture. He had a facsimile of a picture that is in the galleries here in London by an author, uh, uh, an artist called Frederick Watts, and it was called Hope. And the message of that picture was, even in hopeless situations like Mandela being in prison for 27 years, you have got to give people hope. It said you can survive for 40 days without water, without food, eight days without water, eight minutes without air. But they say you cannot survive for a second without hope. And what Nelson Mandela talked about, and that picture portrayed, is the need for us to give people hope about the future. Hope is not wishful thinking, saying, well, perhaps Labour may be elected. Hope is not optimism. Perhaps Labour can be elected. Hope is the realistic expectation that we will do everything in power, in our power, to secure that we return to power and be elected. And if we cannot give people hope, and if over these next few months as things get worse as they will, the National Health Service under more pressure, workers' rights squeezed, the social charter at risk, the BBC or parts of it about to be privatised, young people finding that housing benefit, income tax credits, and grants and tuition fees are all being cut, and in many cases cut away entirely. If we cannot give people the realistic hope that we can do something about it, the realistic expectation that we are working hard and we have elected people who would ensure that there is a Labour government and will do their best to make that possible, then people will walk away from us and we will lose the support for many years. So it's obvious to me that the lessons of our history show that we have got to be a party that pursues the art of the desirable and not the possible. But to secure the desirable and to persuade people of it, we've got to be popular and electable and not simply be a party of protest. And so the question people may ask is this. Well, why all the turmoil now? What is different about now from the years that have gone in the past? Why does it look as if Labour is in so much difficulty now even worse than perhaps in the 1950s when we lost three elections or the 1970s and 80s when eventually we lost four elections. Why is it that people sense Labour is in turmoil now? Of course it's partly because we lost an election that we expected to win. Of course it's also because we know that the Conservatives could be in power for 10 years. But you know, there is a bigger picture to this. And it's all over Europe and it's across America as well. It's the insecurity that people feel when they see the changes that are being wrought in their lives as a result of what they sense is a runaway train, a process of global change and globalization that looks out of control and indeed uncontrollable. And it's making people insecure. It's making people uncertain. It is making people unmoored. It is making people angry. It is making people turn to alternatives in nationalism, in protectionism, in anti-immigrant isolationism, and in many forms of extremism. It's an attempt by many people to bring control back home. That's what the nationalist argument, of course, is, and the protectionist. They'll bring control back home. And you can see if the global movement of people, as we've seen in these last few months, is causing so much consternation. And then behind that is the global movement of services and goods and capital where it used to be purely within national borders or at least the majority of it in national borders. It's threatening people's jobs in competition with China and other countries. It's threatening people's livelihoods because wages are being squeezed by low wage competition. It's threatening people's sense of the prospects that their young children can have in the future. And it's making people worried about the future. And they say that the changes wrought by globalization are 10 times the speed and 100 times the scale of the changes that brought the Industrial Revolution. And it's that that is causing people to ask, what are the alternatives? What are the answers? How can I look forward to a future when I see the scale of global competition, the huge changes wrought by technological advance, the threat to existing occupations, some of the jobs, boiler makers, clerks, secretaries going, parts of the work of radiologists, doctors, even lawyers, computerized and digitalized, jobs that we've never heard of by name said to be the jobs of the future, like drone dispatcher, 
avatar assistant, robot culture. These are the jobs that people are talking about for the future, and it's hardly surprising with these comical names that people are insecure about what the prospects for the children are. And we can't just be an anti-globalization party. We can't just say we don't like what's happening. We can't just say we'll have protests and demonstrations. There was one in Washington when I was there a few years ago. Worldwide campaign against globalization was the banner in that demonstration. <laughs> and we can't just say we can return to the policies of the past. You know, George Bernard Shaw had a huge argument in the 1940s with Michael Foote, who became the leader of our party. He was a great writer as well as a great democratic socialist. And Michael Fruit wrote an article about George Bernard Shaw's proposals for what he called a command economy that were put forward in 1945. And Michael said, these ideas, they're 20%, out, they're 20 years, he said, out of date. And George Bernard Shaw took some time, but he replied in the columns of Tribute, and he said, yes, Michael Foot is right. My ideas were first written down 20 years ago, he said, but at that time, he said, they were 50 years ahead of the time. <laughs> and if Michael Foot was flawed, the problem is this. These ideas that we're talking about, about building a command economy in Britain, are many years behind the time. The commanding heights of economy are now knowledge, education, and information. And if the commanding heights of finance towering over people's lives are a problem, they're a problem not just in Britain, they are a problem because the ownership and control of the finance that we're talking about is not just in Britain. It's in America, it's in Europe, it's in Japan, it's in Korea, it's in China. And the only way you can deal with these international forces, as I found during the global recession, when we had to have international coordinated action to underpin the world economy, is by global cooperation and by global alliances. And I just say to you this. If we're going to solve the problems of both the global economy, global finance, global climate change, if we're going to solve the problems of global inequality and poverty, we will need a level of global cooperation to match our national endeavors that is higher and at a far more sustained and advanced level than ever before. And I have to say that if our global alliances are going to be alliances with Hezbollah and Hamas, and Hugo Chavez's Venezuela, and Vladimir Putin's Russia, there is absolutely no chance of building a worldwide alliance that can deal with poverty and inequality and climate change and financial instability. And we've got to face up to that plan. And I'll say one other thing, what about, and I'll say one other thing, what about Europe? We led the way, Britain, we should be proud, progressives in Britain, we led the way in defeating totalitarianism and fascism and Nazism in the continent of Europe. We led the way in defeating anti-Semitism and we led the way in defeating racism. And how can we say that for progressives, the best way of force facing the future is to abandon cooperation with Europe, to leave our membership of the European Union just at the time when our leadership is needed more than ever to fight protectionism and xenophobic isolationism and all the extremes of racism, discrimination, and prejudice, whether it be against gays, or against women, or against children, or against people who are disabled in this continent. And we have to face facts. If we want to make changes, we need alliances across the world. You know this, there has to be changes also in the way we think about our party. There's a great story told by my old friend, who's now dead, unfortunately, Frank McElhone about trying to join the Labour Party in the 1970s. And Frank, who was a member in Glasgow, insisted that you had to have an interview with him in his office, in a place that was actually, strangely enough, called Frank's Bank. <laughs> and before you paid your subscription and he took it, he would ask you a number of questions. And he would say, are you a member of the militant tendency? And the guy would be applying for membership, and he said, no. He said, are you a member of Workers' Action? The guy said, no. Are you a member of the International Socialist? He said, no. Are you a member of the International Marxist Group? He said, no. Are you a member of any fourth international group uh, that's a socialist group in this country? And the guy would say, no. And even Frank would say, well, why do you want to join the Labour Party? <laughs> now, I know that the problems 
of the past have been exitism and not entryism. But you know this, there is an issue that we've got to face up to. We cannot judge the success of the members of the party by the number of resolutions that are passed. It's by the numbers of people we recruit who used to be liberals or conservatives or non-aligned or nationalists who come to our doors. If we believe in the principles of fellowship and cooperation, if we're mounting a party that is organized for the future, then we have to be looking outwards and not looking inwards. We have to be reaching out to people beyond our ranks. We cannot allow ourselves to be in a debate just with ourselves and not with the people we need to persuade. We cannot, in the end, call ourselves a movement if a movement does not mean that we're reaching out, broadening, deepening, widening our support all the time. And I'll tell you this, as someone who has had some experience of fighting elections, the British people, most of them share the values that we would talk about at its most basic. They're not dogmatists, they're not doctrinaire, they're not ideologues, but the British people that I know, or the majority of people I know, they do feel the pain of others. They do believe in something bigger than just themselves and their own interests. They do. They cannot feast and be happy when other people are sad and hungry. They cannot be at ease when millions of people are ill at ease. They cannot be secure when they find millions of people insecure. They cannot feel comfortable when there are millions of people without comfort. And I believe we can persuade them that it's not anti-wealth to say that those with wealth should do more to help those who are not so wealthy. It's not anti-enterprise to say that those who have benefited from the skills as a, in an enterprise should help those who have never had the chance to be enterprising. It's not anti-market to say that markets can only survive with values and markets need morals. And it's not anti-patriotic, and I think we can persuade them of this, that when the Conservatives seek to divide this country, English nationalism versus Scottish nationalism, North versus South, London versus the rest, middle class against what they call people who are scroungers. When the Conservatives try to divide this country, we can show that the Labour Party is the best party to unite it for the future. So there are five lessons I've learned from being in government and from my membership of the Labour Party. The first is this, and we should <coughs> remember this as we vote. Our principles require us to seek government and to seek power on behalf of people. It's a principle of being in the Labour Party. It's part of our DNA that we not only want to pursue social justice, but we need to have before us the means by which we achieve it, and that requires us to elect a Labour government. And secondly, it's part of being Labour that we have to listen, and we have to learn, and we have to look outwards, and we have to try to bring people to our side and earn their trust because there is no other way of securing power than by persuasion. And we are best able to show people that our values represent theirs. That success is not one person succeeding at the expense of others, but all of us succeeding together. That progress is all of us moving forward rather than just some and moving forward together. And I think the third thing we can show people is it's not enough just to be anti, anti-globalization, anti this, anti that. People are angry, but they also want answers and they want alternatives. And we can show with the measures that we can put forward, and we've seen them in this leadership campaign, a national care service, guarantees that young people will have training and employment, changes in the way we run our economy, changes in the way we run our welfare state, new ideas about how young people can play a fuller part in society, all these ideas. We can show that despite all these challenges that bring insecurity caused by globalization, we can give globalization a human face and show it can be managed by international cooperation and by national action in the interests of the people. And the fourth thing I've learned is you cannot survive unless you can give people hope. And if we cannot show people there is a realistic prospect of electing a Labour government that can undo most of the damage that is being done and at the same time can build for the future, then we will have an electorate that will increasingly ask questions about us and our ability to be their representatives. So we have to show that we can give people hope. But you know, there's a final lesson, and it's about the vote you're gonna cast in this leadership election. Yes, we all vote in private, but in my view, voting on this occasion 
It cannot just be a private act. It's about performing a public service. And let me tell you what I mean. We cannot just vote for ourselves. We cannot just vote for what makes us feel good. We cannot just vote for what you might call on Facebook what you like as opposed to what you dislike. We have to vote for others. We have to vote for the people who need a Labour government most. We have to vote for the people who have been left out, are losing out, being left behind, and have no chance without us being on their side and able to show them that there is a pathway to power that can deliver the priorities that they have. And remember, because it's still relevant, what Gandhi said in the 1920s. He said to people, if ever you are in any doubt about what course of action you should take, he said, recall and remember the face of the poorest, the most vulnerable person that you have ever met. And then, he said, you'll be in no doubt what you should do. And so, I believe that our vote is both a public duty and a sacred trust. It's a public duty because we have got to show that the Labour Party can be at the service of the country and that we can change society for the better in the future. It's not a vote just for the Labour Party, it's a vote for what kind of country we want to see and what kind of country we want to build. And our vote is a sacred trust. Because in the hands of those people who receive the ballot papers, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, perhaps even Thursday, in the hands is a sacred trust. The trust about the future and the fate of the Labour Party, but not only that, in our hands and in our trust is the future of what kind of country we can create in the future and what kind of Labour Party, therefore, we are building to do so. You know, the last words of Aniron Bevan, whom I mentioned earlier, the creator of the National Health Service, were words uttered to Michael Foote. And Michael Foote went to visit Aniron Bevan, then dying on his deathbed. And Aniron Bevan said to Michael Foote these words, Never underestimate, he said, the passion of the Labour Party members for unity. Never underestimate, he said, the instinctive desire to help when they can. And what he meant was help for others. What he meant was help where people were in poverty or in difficulty. What he meant was what Maxon called the immediate relief of suffering as a necessity that all of us feel out of compassion and conviction that needs to be done. So yes, let us remember as we vote, the Labour Party has been the greatest fighting force for fairness this country has ever seen. Let us remember that the Labour Party has been the best instrument for social progress at any time in the centuries and decades of our country's history. Let us remember that without the Labour Party, we may lack an emancipating force to tackle prejudice and discrimination and intolerance in our midst, not just now and in the past, but in the future. And remember that we seek power for a purpose. We seek power out of principle. But we cannot win power if we do not win the people. And so remember in conclusion, an Iron Bevan's final words, the desire, the instinctive desire, to do what we can to help people and make that the test of how you vote in the next few days. Thank you very much.